Good morning, Hope Community Church. So glad to be with you this morning. Uh, If we haven't met yet, my name is Chandler, and I have the privilege of serving as the college pastor here, and then my wife Avery and I help lead community groups as well, and so excited to be with you. I want to do something a little different. Um, What what I want us to do is something that we're calling 60 Seconds of Prayer, and so there's going to be a list of kind of prayer topics that I'm going to talk through, but really this is an opportunity for all of us to get to participate for us to get to pause and to pray over these things. And so I'm going to talk through them, and then we're going to take a minute right where you're at, just silently. Um, You can pray with your spouse. You can pray with your family. You can pray by yourself. But I want us to pray for these things. I want us to pray first that our hearts would be guarded. Proverbs 4 tells us that above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. I want to pray that our souls would be fed realizing that that we get to feast together as a family every time we gather under this word. I want to pray that our minds would be renewed and that our eyes would be fixed on Jesus, not on someone else, not on circumstances, not on me, but fixed on Jesus alone. So let's just take a minute right where you're at and let's pray for these things. Father, we thank you for these moments. We thank you for the silence, for the stillness. God, we do pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that our souls would be fed, that we would be fulfilled and satisfied as we spend this time in your word. God, we pray that our minds would be renewed. God, that we would not be conformed to the ways of this world, but we would be transformed by renewing of our mind. God, we pray that our eyes be fixed on Jesus and Jesus alone. And God, right now, I do pray for for those students, for the salvations, for the lives that have been transformed forever. Lord, I pray that we would celebrate that, we would rejoice in that. God, that we, as the family of God, would come alongside them, walk with them, care for them, be for them, and be with them. So God, we love you, we praise you for this time that we get to have together. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So two and a half years ago, I was living in Mars Hill, just near Asheville. Um, it's where I went to school, and at that time I was serving at a church there, and, and I had the brilliant idea, I wasn't married yet, and I had this idea to get a dog. So I bought this golden doodle, his name is Asher, and uh, let me just say, Asher, he's a really sweet dog. And don't you love when everybody says that he's a sweet dog? That means he's not that smart. He's not that bright. Um, but he is. He, he's sweet. He's fun. Um, he's very, very clingy. Like, very clingy. And I'm not one of those crazy people that likes that, that, like, wants the dog to be around me all the time. That's my wife. She loves that. She loves that Asher is always wanting to be with us. And I was thinking about this. Uh, We actually have a picture of it. Asher at our house, this is what he does. Every time that we leave our house, he sits right there. That's his spot. He might climb up on top of that cushion, and he looks out the window. He's constantly just there. We leave. We come back about five, six, seven hours later. He's still there. I don't think he's moved. I think he's sat there the entire time. He just can't wait for us to be back. And I was thinking about it, and and why would he do that? It's because partly some separation anxiety, one, but but also because he was designed to do that. He was designed and created for connection. Now, not the same as human connection, but he, he was designed and he longs for connection with whoever gives him water, whoever gives him food, whoever gives him shelter, 
whoever is there for him, whoever gives him affection. And so that's what he was created for. And in the same way, humans are designed for connection. We're designed for relationship. I was thinking about it. Avery and I have been married just over eight months. And it's been awesome for me. People ask me how it's been. I say it's been the best. And one of my favorite parts is that after a long day, after a hard day, after good days, is that I get to go home and I get to be with my wife and I get to be with my family. And that's a joy because I was designed for that. I was designed to live in relationship. And what we see in Scripture and what Scripture makes clear to us is that God designed us first for relationship with him. He designed us for relationship with him, and he desires that we would flourish in our relationship with him and our relationship with each other as well. And so today, I have the privilege of sharing and looking at one of the most radical chapters in all of Scripture. We're going to be in Luke 15. If you have your copy of God's Word, you can flip there. Some of you are like, "Uh, this is exactly where we were last week. If you were here last week, Jeremy did preach on this as well. But this is our story. And and so I want to ask you, if you were here, to not check out. Don't check out just because we were in this same passage last week. But I believe that God has more. He has more for us to see here and for us to know from this passage. So a little side note about that. What, What I love is that maybe you've been reading through Luke with us as a church family. I know for me, I'm going through the second time, and it blows me away every time that I could be reading something over and over again, and God would show me something new from it, that there's always something new, that there's always something that it's endless because it's his words. And so hang with me. These are his words. It's open, his voice for us. So before we do that, I want to go ahead and give you two things that that I main objectives, things that I've been praying for you and for me. For today, The first is that you would know God's heart for you, that you would know God's heart for you, that you would really believe, as we sang, that he really loves you, that he really loves you as a father and as a friend. And the next thing is that God's heart would become our heart, that we would be broken over the things that he's broken over. We would rejoice in the things that he rejoices So praying those two things. As we look at Luke 15, what we see is that that it's one of the most radical chapters in all of Scripture. And I believe that it's radical, it being radical and being understood to be so radical, hinges on the first two verses. It says this in verse 1 and 2. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So what Dr. Luke is doing here is is he's laying out for us who the audience is. Who's the crowd that's gathering around Jesus as he's going to tell these stories? Because what Jesus is about to do is he's going to tell three different stories that are all interconnected. In a sense, it's three stories in one movie. And what we see here is that, that Luke describes the audience And I don't think that that for us, as I try to describe it, it's hard for us to even understand just how radical and how unheard of this is. Because what we see here is two different types of people. We see the tax collectors and sinners that are gathering, that have been eating with him, following him. And then we see the Pharisees and the scribes. And we see that they're the ones that have been grumbling, but they're here. They're here in the audience. They're in the crowd as Jesus is sharing. And so as we look at these people, what we see is first the tax collectors. What do we know of the tax collectors? Maybe you're like me, and the first thing, the only thing I actually thought of was Zacchaeus, was this wee little man. Maybe you grew up in church, and you get that cheesy little song stuck in your head, that Zacchaeus was this wee little man. But what we know is that he was a tax collector. And so what a tax collector was is is someone, normally, who, who was Jewish, but that was working for Rome. So they're working for Rome, they're taking taxes away from the Jewish people, and what we see here is that that because of that, they're taking more. They're taking more than's being asked for. So they're thieves, and then also, from the Jewish perspective, they're traitors. Because as we said, that, that Rome, the things that they've done to the Jewish people is unheard of. The Jews, they hate Rome. 
They hate these people, and therefore, they hate these tax collectors because the tax collectors are thieves and traitors. They're profiting off of them, off of their own people. And so if we could imagine the worst things that we know of, that that ISIS, that Nazis, that Al-Qaeda, that any dictator has ever done to a group of people, it still wouldn't be comparable to some of the, the horrible things that Rome has done to the Jews. So their hatred, it seems to be legitimate. The Jews are truly oppressed. But with the tax collectors, what we see is these sinners. Now, the sinners are described as a specific group of people. They're categorized as the people that are sick, that are diseased, that are deformed, the prostitutes, anyone whose sin is a way of life. And then also, who they are as well, is anyone who either their sin or someone in their family's sin has caused a disease or deformity in their life. So they're all there, tax collector and sinner. They're gathering there together to hear from Jesus. We saw that in verse 1, that they draw near to him. And several times in Luke, what we see is this, this word receives, that Jesus receives these people. Six times we see the same Greek word, that I'm not going to try to pronounce. But what it is, it means this. To eagerly await or expect and look for. Eagerly await or expect and look for. So what it means is, what it says is that when Jesus receives them, it's saying that he's not doing so passively, but that he's actually looking for these people. He's drawing them to himself, eagerly awaiting them to come to him, searching them out, And so it's important for us to see that, to see that it's not a passive receiving as we move forward and look at the stories. Because as I said, if the tax collectors and sinners are on this side, the opposite of that is the Pharisees and scribes. So if this is the worst of the worst, this is the best of the best. The Pharisees and scribes are the religious folk. They're the self-righteous, the ones who've done all the right things. In their mind, they're following all the rules. We see that they've memorized all of the Torah. The first five books of the Bible, they memorize it all. But they're here and they're furious. They're furious that Jesus is even associating himself with tax collectors and sinners. Says that they're grumbling. And then what we see is that Jesus, he goes into preaching this sermon. Knowing who the crowd is, knowing who's there, and he first tells two stories that are very similar. Verse 4 through 7, he, he tells the story of a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. And if one sheep went missing, he would leave the 99 and he would go find the one lost sheep. And he says that, in verse 6, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends, his neighbors. He says to them, rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So the shepherd goes and finds the lost sheep. Then he tells the story of a woman who had 10 coins and she misplaces or loses one coin and she goes and she finds the missing coin and she does the same thing. When she finds it, she calls together her friends, her neighbors. She says, rejoice with me. For I have found the coin that I lost, just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what we see here is is two scandalous stories. Two stories of the pursuit of something that was lost being found. How many of you have lost something in your life and it made you freak out? Yeah. Yeah. Many of us, I misplaced phone, keys, wallet. Wallet might be the worst. Talk about freaking out, not a clue where it is. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about when I was younger, I grew up near the Shelby City Park, and we had this little Jack Russell Terrier, this crazy energy dog, and, and she loved to chase things. And there was one time in particular I remember that, that she saw a squirrel in the front yard, and she shot up the hill. She ran up to the city park chasing this squirrel, And so we're freaking out, we're yelling for her, we're looking for her, we go up there, spend hours looking for her, can't find her, no clue where she's at. And then we come home, not sure what to do. Later in the day, she comes walking back home, she's covered in mud, 
happy as could be. There's no telling what she caught, what she ate. But we were just glad that our dog had been found, that she had decided to come home. And so as I think about that, I think of these two stories that we all, we, we can identify that, that we've sought after something that's lost, that we go searching. And when Jesus is telling these first two stories of the pursuit of what's lost, it's found, and he's setting the stage for the last story. He's setting the stage for the last one. But in the first two, thinking about the crowd again, the Pharisees, they have to be pretty angry. I imagine that they're pretty angry because, remember, he's speaking to these people and really about these people. It's easy for them to identify themselves in these stories. These tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees and scribes, they know who they are in the story. In both of the stories, Jesus is saying that it's to be celebrated for the one who's lost to be found. And he leaves it at that. And everyone in the crowd, they know who that is. They know the lost, the unclean, the one who needs saving. It's the tax collectors and sinners. They're the ones who are clearly lost and need to be found. They're the unclean ones. And so from the Pharisees' minds, I imagine they're thinking, how could he ever share something so radical? How could Jesus drop everything to receive these people, to spend time with them, to eat with them, to get to know them? And before we move on and and look at the last story, I want us to see one word that's repeated in verse 7 and verse 10. It's one word that, that many of you, if you grew up in church, you've heard it probably, but it's really a hinge point for us as we look at the last story. It's this word, repentance. Repentance, to repent. This word, as I said, that maybe you've heard, maybe you've been around church. I know for much of my life, I felt sure that I, that I knew what this meant. But as I've been learning and studying, I wouldn't be surprised that when we read this here, we may not have a full understanding of what this word means. Because many of us know repentance to mean to change our mind, to change directions, to turn back. And the Greek meaning of the word is to do that is to make the decision to turn back. But what we see here when Jesus uses it is that he uses the word repent in a more rich, deeper meaning. He uses the Hebrew meaning of the word that means to come home. To repent means to come home, to come home to relationship with the Father. As we said earlier, all of us, that's what we're called to. That's what we're designed for, designed for a relationship with him. So repentance is that, to come home to relationship with God as our Father, to find connection with Him. So the meaning of the word, it points to an invitation, that it's an invitation to come home to relationship, to come home to what we were designed for. So as we look at this last story, we see another picture of coming home, another picture of repentance here again. Verses 11 says this, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. The father divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son, he gathered all he had. He took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property. He lost it all in reckless living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went, he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Now pause for a minute. The Pharisees are hearing this, and I think that they're probably finally thinking, yes, it's about time. It's about time that these people would suffer. Because remember, they're identifying themselves in the stories, and they're thinking it's about time that the ones who took what wasn't theirs are now struggling. They're now suffering. They're hungry. They're in need. They've been profiting off of us for for years. It's about time they're hungry and in need. But already what I think we see in this story is is that we see the grace of the Father that we see his grace over and over again. 
one way that we see it is that it was the grace of the Father to even give the sons their inheritance, to even give it to them. And I think that if we could think about our life and think about Scripture even, this is the way that we see rebellion and the way that we see wrath in Scripture. Because as we think about our life, that, that we, many of us, maybe we've squandered what God has given. And really what I think Romans 1 makes clear is that God's wrath is God allowing us to chase after the things that we want to chase after. That he lets us wear ourselves down. He lets us exhaust ourselves. That it's his grace that even allows you to do that. The father, he gives this younger son his inheritance, and then he lets the son exhaust himself. Jeremy said it this way last week. He said that God loves you enough to let you squander his gifts. And isn't this true in our life? If we could think about our life, what has God allowed you to chase after? Things that that you wanted to chase after. And maybe this past week you've seen that you've squandered something. Maybe since last week you realized that you've been leading your family, you've been leading your, your business in the way that you wanted to rather than the way that God designed and wanted you to for his glory. And we're all there. We're all there. But I, I'm grateful that this story, it doesn't end here with the youngest son stuck in his suffering and his struggle and in his starvation. But what we see, verse 17, it says this. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but I perish here with hunger. I will arise, I'll go to my father, I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He arose, he came to the father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf, kill it, let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. So what we see here is this youngest son out there starving, out there suffering. He puts together this plan. He puts together this plan of how he's going to return home, how he's going to come home to his father. But what we see is that his return plan is that he's going to give up his sonship to just be a servant. So he's going to give up his rights as a son to just go work for the father, to just go be a servant for him. So his picture of repentance, of coming home, in his mind, it's not one of coming home for relationship but rather to just come home and be a hired servant. This is the the beautiful story of God's grace and restoration of a relationship is because the father goes and runs after him. He runs to him. Right here in in the story, what we see is the father's response and we see the father's delight. Jeremy shared how radical it was in this culture for the father to have ran, to have ran to him. What we see is that he runs to him. He doesn't let the son just become a servant, does he? No, but he won't even let the son carry his own sin. And so the father receives the son. What we see here is that the father doesn't let this son stay lost. The father doesn't let this son stay lost. And you might hear that statement and you're thinking, yeah, but that doesn't make much sense because in the first two stories... It was the shepherd and it was the woman who went out and found. And in this story, the youngest son comes home. He's the one who goes back. But what we see here and what I believe we see and want you to see is that if the son was to come home and be a servant, he'd still be lost. If he were to come home and just be a servant, he'd still be lost because he wouldn't be who he was designed to be. He was designed to be a son of the Father. True repentance in his life would be to come home as a son, to come home to this relationship with his Father. He'd still be lost. 
because he wouldn't be who he was designed to be. But what we see is that the Father, he invites him in. He welcomes him back in. He receives him back in. I believe that we have to get that today, is that God wants that for you today. He wants that for you. That it, for you to see that he has designed you and desired for you to live in relationship with him. To live in a relationship with him as a son or as a daughter. He doesn't care about all of your religious activities, all the things that you can do for him. But he wants you to be with him in relationship. And to see what he's already done for you. And what I think uh, we see in our life is that God's pursuit of his children is so that they would come home to relationship with him. His pursuit of you and me as his children is that we would come home, we would repent, we would come home to a relationship with him. Not that we would worry about all the things that we can do for him, that we would find joy in being his children. We see that it was the father's delight to, to save his family, remembering again that Jeremy showed us that, that the party that's thrown is just as much for the father as it is the son. The father's the one rejoicing and finding joy that his son is alive, that his son has been found. So the father, he delights in this. He delights to save his family. He delights to save us. In all three of these stories, what we see when what was lost is found, we see a celebration, right? We see a party. We see a party in heaven. We see a party on this farm with this family. God celebrates this. He celebrates repentance. He rejoices in repentance, in coming home. And I had a moment. I got to go to Crossroads Camp as well, and it was awesome to see unbelievable life change. But if I can be honest, there was a moment where I found myself the first night worrying more about the legitimacy of some of the salvations rather than celebrating what God had been doing. I remember the next day I'd been reading this and, and studying and walking to the student center and feeling conviction from the Holy Spirit that I had not been celebrating what God was celebrating. Now, I'm not saying that there's not wisdom in the conversations and the things that, that happen after that, but I found myself in that moment realizing that I had not rejoiced over just one sinner who repented and came home to a relationship with God. That's what happened in that room. More than one, hundreds of them. But God was celebrating that. God celebrates when repenters, we place our faith in Jesus, when we come home to a relationship with him. So we should party when that happens. We should celebrate that. We will through baptism. Not to be timid, not to be unsure. But we get to celebrate because he celebrates. And he delights to do so. He delights to save his family. It's his hope that all would come home. It is his hope that we would all return to him, come home to have a relationship with him as our father. He's not going to force you to come home. But lovingly, he welcomes us to himself. And he doesn't desire that we just be robots, that we just be servants. But he desires for us to have connection with him, to have intimacy with him, to have a relationship with him. And I, I long for us to get this. I long for us to see the beauty of this, that God wants to have a relationship with you. That you would know that, that he wants to have a relationship with you. Not a formal business partnership, not a legalistic transaction, not a once-a-week meeting where we just come here and that's it. Because sadly, that's not a relationship. But he offers us the opportunity to come to him as our father and as our friend, that we get to be with him. We get to spend time with him. But we know, many of us know, that, that it can be really easy to get to know a lot about him, but not really know him. We can know a lot about God, but not know him. I was thinking about this. Avery and I, we, we watch different things on YouTube, but we watch these different people and different families who are vlogging their life and all these different things. And what I find fascinating about it is how quickly we get wrapped up in it and we start to think that we actually know these people. 
Like, we get to know a lot about them, and we get to see their life and all these things that they do, and it's really easy to think that we know these people. Well, we don't know them, do we? No, we, we don't know them. We don't have a relationship with them. We just watch these videos. We get to know a lot about them. And what we see Jesus do here is that he's getting ready to address the people in the crowd who've known a lot about God, but they haven't really known him. He's going to address the Pharisees and scribes as he talks about the older son. He says this, verse 25. Now the older son was in the field. He came, he drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brothers come. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But this brother was angry. He refused to go in. His father came out, asked him about it, and he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So as I said, the older son, he resembles who in the crowd? He resembles the Pharisees and the scribes, the self-righteous, the religious, the jealous, the prideful. So this brother, he resents the younger, but more than that, he resents the father. He's bitter towards him. He says, why don't you give me a go? Why don't you give me what I deserve? I've done all these things. I've obeyed you. Why don't you let me celebrate with my friends? I've been doing the right things all along. And the older brother, he, what we see here is that, that he may have been obedient, but we get the sense that he's just as lost as the youngest son. He's just as lost because he's not living in a relationship with the father. No, he, he's doing all these things, and he's being self-righteous and thinking that he deserves all these things, but he's not living in a relationship with the father. He's not close to the father's heart. He's pretty far from it. And I think we see something interesting here as well. I was thinking of my life of how often I do this. I do what this older brother has done. That I got a problem with a brother or sister in Christ. And the first thing, what, what is our inclination? Our first thing we want to do is we want to go and complain. We want to go and complain to somebody else, right? The brother, he went and complained to a servant. He went and complained and griped to this servant rather than what he had the opportunity to do, the opportunity that you and me both have the opportunity, to talk with the Father. And what we see in our life is that the older brothers, they talk about brothers to other people rather than talking with the Father, rather than praying for someone, rather than seeking the Father on their behalf and my behalf, it's much easier for me to just talk about them to somebody else, to complain and think that that's going to make me feel better. And I hope and pray that that wouldn't be us. That as a family, that we would see that we can talk with the Father. That we can spend time with Him. We can draw close to Him and to His heart. We often say the phrase, home is where the heart is. And I believe this only to be true when our hearts are returning to our Father and His heart. When we're coming home to how God designed and desired for us to live and to flourish in a relationship with him. So home is where the Father is. Our happiness, our joy, our satisfaction, our fulfillment is only found in him. It's only found with him. And I can't tell this story without thinking of my own story and God's grace in my life that I've been both brothers. That at times I still live as both brothers realizing that I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be in this room, I shouldn't be on this stage if it wasn't for God's grace in my life. For far too long, living my life 
searching for the approval of others, doing things that I thought was going to cause them to approve of me or things that I thought was just going to fulfill me. All things that just leave you empty after you've squandered all these things, lost it all like the youngest. And then I've been the oldest son where I've tried to do a lot of good things. I've tried to earn God's love, tried to earn the Father's love by doing more and more and more and achieving, achieving, achieving. And all of that leaving you empty as well because you're not living and flourishing out of a relationship with God as our Father. And I hope and pray that this would be us, that we would see that God desires our hearts, that he desires all of our lives. For those of you in the room who who maybe you've never given your, your life to him, he wants to give you a new heart for you to become alive, to live in him. He's pursuing you and me. Even now, he's pursuing us, not forcefully, but with open arms, just as the Father does. With open arms, we see in Scripture that it's his kindness that leads to repentance. That it's his kindness that leads us to come home to have a relationship with him. What we see is that God was the shepherd who sought after the lost sheep. He was the finder of the lost coin. He was the father who welcomed a son, invited a son to come home and to still be a son. This is the grace of God that's extended to all of us, extended to everyone in the crowd, the tax collector, the sinner, the Pharisee, the scribe, all of us. This is his grace for us. And you know, for me right now, it can be easy to just read these passages, challenge all of us to take these things, apply them to our life. Let's go pursue people. Let's find the lost. Let's win them to Christ. And we must do all of those things. Like, I I want that for us. We must do that. But I think what we must first do is we must first stop and consider Jesus. Stop and consider Jesus. Consider his heart. Consider who he is, his love, his grace, how he has pursued us find it interesting that Jesus, he didn't end the parable with go and do likewise. Dr. Luke didn't say go and imitate Jesus. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do those things. We must. But I believe that all of that flows out of this relationship that we have with God as our father and as our friend. So would we consider him? Would we see Jesus? Would we see that he was the one who made a way for us to be welcomed back into the family of God? Just as the father didn't let the son carry his own sin, so has God done for you and me. He doesn't let us carry our sin, our guilt, and our shame any longer, but he places it on his perfect son, Jesus. That on a criminal's cross, our sins would be paid for that we could have a relationship with the Father. As Jesus, he defeats sin, death, and the grave, that he offers us this way to be made right with the Father, this relationship that we get to have with him, that that he's actually gonna send his spirit to indwell within us, the presence of God with us, that we wouldn't have to travel to some building, some place to be with him, but no, we can have a relationship with him every day, every moment, every second, We can be with him. We can read his word. We can pray. We can speak with him. That invitation, it's on the table for you today to come home, to come home to a relationship with him. Maybe you've been on vacation. Maybe you ran away from home. And you just need to come home You need to be received by a father who's there with outstretched arms. So I want us to take a few moments to do that. I want want us to sit silently and reflect in just a moment on who Jesus is. I want us to see Jesus, to draw near to him as the crowd did, that he invited them all in, just like he is to you and me. And maybe as we've been talking about father, 
you, you have a horrible relationship with your earthly father and it's, it's tarnished this idea for you. And we want to pray for you that, that you would see that you have a perfect heavenly father who is for you, who loves you, who wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to just be a servant, but he wants you to sit at his table as a son or as a daughter. And you might be in here right now and you would say that that you've been coming to church for a while. But by the Spirit of God in this time, your, your heart's been pounding because you realize now that you've been a prodigal even though you've physically been here. Your heart has been far from the Father's heart. You haven't been spending time with Him. You haven't lived into and experienced the fullness of this relationship with Him as your Father. You need to see that you're a son or a daughter of the King. Sons and daughters. That we would look at Jesus, we would see that He made that possible. And if you're curious about what it looks like, how do I repent? How do I come home? It's been far too long then we would love, one, to talk with you. We would love to pray with you. You can fill out one of those connect cards and let us know. In a moment, I'm going to have questions that we're going to talk through and and reflect upon, and then we're going to continue to sing. And as we sing, you can come to the altar and pray. You can pray with one another. You can stay seated where you're at. Whatever you feel like you need to do in these moments. But I want us to take advantage of these moments to see that that God desires a relationship with us. He desires for us to come home to him. So the questions here is, first one is, where's your heart? Where's your heart? What have you been longing for? What have you been looking to? What have you been chasing after? What's an attribute of Jesus? that you see in these stories. Next is, have you been experiencing God as father and as friend, or have you just been living like the older son as a servant, not experiencing the fullness of a relationship with him? And then what have you been celebrating? Is it the things that God is celebrating? Life change, like we're gonna get to in a moment. Or is it other things, riches, money, fame, being liked by other people rather than being loved and approved by a father. I want to pray for us and you can continue to reflect as we get ready to worship through song. Father, you are good. Lord, you are here. I thank you, Lord, that you welcome me into your family. God, that you've designed me for this relationship with you, Lord, you desire that I would have it, that I would flourish, not living for myself, but always for you. God, I pray for any heart in this room, Lord, that that in this moment, Lord, that they've just been struggling, they've been suffering, feeling lonely, Lord, I pray that they are reminded right now that you love them, that you care for them as a father loves a son. As you love us, Lord, we we think of that that picture of the father with outstretched arms, running and embracing a son, not letting him carry his own sin any longer. Lord, you don't desire that we try to carry our own sin, Lord, but you, you take it for us as you placed it on Jesus on the cross. Our sins paid for. Lord, I pray for the hearts that, that maybe have been here. God, but been struggling with apathy and to experience the fullness of relationship. Right now, I pray that they see your beauty, they see your grace, they feel your presence and your spirit in a new way, in a thick and a tangible way. God, I pray that we would celebrate, we would rejoice what you rejoice in. Sinners repenting, coming home to faith in you coming home to a relationship with you, passing from death to life, from darkness to light. Lord, we love you and praise you that you make that possible. In Jesus' name we pray.